working to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Alma Angeles, welcome to ASEAN in Focus. We're coming to you live from Manila and Indonesia. Hello, December. Hello, Alma. I'm December Paras bringing you the news and the dynamic ASEAN region on today's headlines. First in our headlines, the death toll from the strongest typhoon to hit the Philippines this year has surged to 208, according to the National Police, making it one of the deadliest storms to hit the country in recent years. Following his visit to areas devastated by Typhoon Odette, international name Rai, during the weekend, President Duterte committed uh, two billion worth of government aid in typhoon hit areas. And Myanmar's ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi is expected to hear the verdict in her trial for illegally importing walkie-talkies today. The latest in a catalog of judgments in a junta court that could see her jailed for decades. More than 30,000 people were evacuated from their homes in Malaysia on Sunday as the country battles some of its worst flooding in years. First in our news, the death toll from the strongest typhoon to hit the Philippines this year has surged to more than 200, according to the National Police, making it one of the deadliest storms to hit the country in recent years. Take a look. At least 239 people were injured, 52 were missing, after Typhoon Rai ravaged the southern and central regions of the archipelago, according to a police tally. More than 300,000 people fled their homes and beachfront resorts as Rai slammed into the country on Thursday as a super typhoon. The Philippine Red Cross has reported complete carnage in coastal areas. Homes, hospitals, school and community buildings have been ripped to shreds, according to Red Cross Chairman Richard Gordon earlier. The storm tore off roofs, uprooted trees, toppled concrete power poles, smashed wooden houses to pieces and flooded villages, sparking comparisons with Super Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. Haiyan, also called Yolanda in the Philippines, was the deadliest cyclone on record in the country, leaving more than 7,300 people dead or missing. One of the hardest hit islands this time was Bohol, known for its beaches, rolling chocolate hills, and tiny tarsier primates where at least 74 people have died, according to Provincial Governor Arthur Yap on his official Facebook page. There has also been widespread destruction on Siargao, Dinagat, and Mindanao Islands, which bore the brunt of the storm when it slammed into the country, packing wind speeds of 195 kilometers per hour. SOS was seen painted on a road in the popular tourist town of General Luna on Siargao Island, where surfers and holiday makers or holiday makers had blocked ahead of December 25 as people struggled to find water and food. Swathes of the affected areas have no communications, hampering efforts of disaster agencies to assess the full extent of the storm's damage. Electricity has also been knocked out, affecting water refilling stations and ATMs. Super Typhoon Rai is the most powerful to hit the Philippines this year and comes late in the region's typhoon season with most cyclones developing between July and October. And scientists have long warned that rising global temperatures induced by man-made climate change are causing typhoons to become more powerful and strengthen more rapidly. The Philippine Navy through the Philippine fleet is now assembling a 19-ship humanitarian aid focus flotilla that will be deployed in areas severely devastated by Typhoon Odette. This relief flotilla consists of seven sea lift vessels for the uh, transport of relief goods and uh, locally stranded individuals to patrol ships for command and uh, control eight other watercraft as general support vessels. Meanwhile, the presidential yacht BRP Ang Pangulo ACS-25 has been repurposed as 
hospital ship, the Philippine fleet said in a Facebook post Sunday night. It added that BRP Tarlac or LD601, BRP Bacolod City LS550, BRP Antonio Luna FF151, BRP Andres Bonifacio PS17, BRP Iwak or Iwak LC289, BRP Agta LC290, and BRP Ibatan LC298 are to be deployed to augment ongoing humanitarian assistance and disaster response efforts. HADR in Cebu, Palawan, and uh, Northern Mindanao, especially Surigao, Dinagat, and Siargao Islands. Aside from the ships, the PN uh, also placed four naval aircraft on alert status to uh, provide aerial survey, immediately or immediate rescue, and limited transport capabilities of the flotilla. The naval air component consists of two Islander craft or NV312 and NV314, one Beechcraft King Air C90 aircraft or NV394, and one ship based Augusta Westland uh, helicopter or N430. These assets are provided by the Cavite City based Philippine fleet under the command of Rear uh, Admiral Alberto B. Carlos. Following his visit to areas devastated by Typhoon Odette with international name Rai during the weekend, President Duterte committed 2 billion pesos worth of government aid in typhoon-hit areas. In a radio interview on Sunday, acting presidential spokesperson Carlo Nograles said the president made the commitment when he met local chief executives in the affected areas. The president visited Shergao Island in Surigao del Norte, Dinagat Islands, and Maasian City in southern Leyte on Saturday to personally assess the impact of Odette. According to a Business Mirror report, Senator Bong Go joined the president in an aerial inspection of the hardest hit areas in Surigao del Norte, Dinagat Islands, and southern Leyte. During the situational briefing in Maasin City, the president pledged to release 1 billion pesos in calamity funds to the affected local government units and another 1 billion pesos to the concerned government agencies, saying the government is aiming for the earliest return to normalcy. He also directed officials to make sure funds are available for the procurement of food, medicines, and other essential needs, according to Senator Goh's office. Other issues which President Duterte wants to be immediately addressed are the immediate distribution of relief goods to the affected communities and their housing needs. He also assigned Social Welfare Secretary Rolando Bautista to serve as the crisis manager in Shergao and Dinagat Islands to ensure the swift deployment of food and non-food items in the said areas. Myanmar's also leader Aung San Suu Kyi is expected to hear the verdict in her trial for illegally importing walkie-talkies on Monday. The latest in a catalog of judgments in a junta court that could see her jail for decades. Any comment, Mr. Suu Kyi? Suu Kyi, 76, faces three years in prison if found guilty on charges of illegally importing walkie-talkies and possessing walkie-talkies without a license. The first case filed against her by the junta. The charges stem from the early hours of the coup when soldiers and poli police raided her house and allegedly found her in possession of the contraband equipment. Under cross-examination, members of the raiding party admitted that they had not possessed a search warrant for the raid. According to a source with knowledge of the matter, an analyst says or analysts say it's unlikely Suu Kyi will be taken away to jail on Monday and it is possible the OPEC Junta court will delay giving a verdict. Earlier this month, she was jailed for four years for incitement against the military and breaching COVID rules in a ruling that was widely condemned by the international community. Junta Chief Min Ang Lai later commuted the term to two years and said she should, she would serve her sentence under house arrest at the capital, Night of Dao. So she is also charged with multiple counts of corruption, each of which is punishable by 15 years in jail and violating the Official we Secrets Act. In other news, hundreds of prisoners set fire to a Thai jail during a two-day riot. 
over the handling of a coronavirus cluster with some inmates wounded as officers sought to restore order. The prison has a population of more than 2,100 and roughly 300 have tested positive. Take a look. The uh, conviction and long prison sentence handed down to four prominent human rights defenders in Vietnam for spreading so-called anti-state propaganda has been condemned by the United Nations Rights Office or United Nations Rights Office, OHCHR. Here's uh, Ms. Shamdasani now. Let's take a look. Spreading. In the span of three days this week, four prominent human rights defenders, Chik Ba Pong, Win Thi Tham, Do Nam Tung, and independent author, uh, author Pham Dang Cha were sentenced to up to 10 years in jail and five years on probation under Articles 88 and 117 of Vietnam's uh, Criminal Code. These were all followed by, by prolonged pretrial detention. Tin was sentenced to 10 years in prison and five on probation. Win was uh, sentenced to six years in prison and three years on probation. Do was sentenced to 10 years in jail and four years on probation. And Pham was to, sentenced to nine years imprisonment. The charges against these five people who were reporting on human rights and land rights and who were arrested in 2020 and 2021 appear to be part of a campaign to silence and intimidate those who raise their voices in defense of human rights. All the cases follow similar worrying patterns that raise serious issues concerning their presumption of innocence, the legality of their detention, and the fairness of their trial. There is prolonged incommunicado pre-trial detention, prosecution under the vaguely worded offense of spreading anti-state propaganda, denial of access to legal counsel, and closed trials that do not respect international fair trial standards. We also call on the government to repeal all legal provisions that violate fundamental freedoms. The articles of the criminal code under which these charges were brought are vague and overly broad and thereby inconsistent with international human rights norms. Cases of this kind contribute to a climate of self-censorship in the country and have a chilling effect on media freedom. They also prevent people from exercising their fundamental rights and engaging in public debate on issues of importance. Don Nam Trong, well known for taking part in environmental and anti-China protests and opposing government corruption, was sentenced on Thursday to 10 years in jail. Activists Trin Ba Pong and Nguyen Thi Tam were sentenced a day earlier to 10 years and 6 years in jail, respectively on the same charge. On Tuesday, one of Vietnam's most prominent dissident journalists, Pham Don Trang, was sentenced to nine years behind bars on anti-state charges. In other news, the decision by Bangladesh 
To close schools for Rohingya refugees risks leaving a generation of children practically uneducated, according to a UN human rights envoy warning this on Saturday or Sunday. Authorities this week ordered the closure of unauthorized education centers in border camps hosting around 850,000 members of the stateless Muslim minority who fled there from violent persecution in neighboring Myanmar. The order came during a visit by UN Special Rapporteur Tom Andrews, who said the privately run schools played a critical role in educating Rohingya children. He said, I am deeply concerned to have learned of a new policy promulgated while I was here that would close all private schools in the camps, he told reporters in the capital, Dhaka. He said, we cannot allow an entire generation of Rohingya to go practically uneducated, he added. Bangladesh's foreign ministry has said the order will not impact around 3,000 learning centers for children in camps supported by the United Nations Children's Fund or UNICEF. It also claimed the move had been made to halt the operations of schools promoting radicalism and engaged in illegal activities. Angered Rohingya activists in the camp have taken to social media to protest the decision in lieu of public protests which have become difficult since security was boosted after the murder of a top camp leader in September. The New York-based Human Rights Watch said about 30,000 children will lose their access to education if Bangladesh doesn't reverse the closures. Twelve people, including three foreigners, died Friday in flash floods which swept through northern Iraq after torrential rains in Arbil, capital of the autonomous Kurdistan region. In a country dealing with severe drought, many were caught by surprise as powerful storm water started surging into their homes in the city's eastern suburbs before dawn. Provincial Governor Omid Koshna said a 10-month-old baby, a Turk, and two Filipino nationals were among the 12 people killed. Iraq has been hit by a succession of extreme weather events. It has endured blistering temperatures and repeated droughts in recent years, but has also experienced intense floods made worse when torrential rainfalls on sun-baked earth. Experts have warned that record low rainfall compounded by climate change are threatening social and economic disaster in war-scarred Iraq. The effects of low rainfall have been exacerbated by falling water levels on the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers as a result of dam building in neighboring Turkey and Iran, Sama Hadid of the uh, Norwegian Refugee Council, uh, NRC has said. Meanwhile, more than 30,000 people were evacuated from their homes in Malaysia on Sunday as the country battled some of its worst flooding in years. Take a look. The tropical Southeast Asian nation... I mean, floods in off... KL are quite normal, but it's not that massive. But this is really a massive one. This is, I think this is, I think I can consider it as a second big flood in KL. Back in 1971, there is the biggest flood in KL. So now, just 50 years now another big flood here, so this is uh, a disaster for us. Uh, very sad, but we have no choice. There's only choice that we have to move on and we clean up the mess, then we will continue our new chapter. Some of the houses, they already come out, but there are still people uh, refuse to come out. Uh, they want to stay at their second floor. But I really hope that um, for safety purpose, please come out. Lah. The Southeast Asian nation often sees stormy months and seasons towards the end of the year, with flooding regularly prompting mass evacuations. Downpours since Friday have caused rivers to overflow, submerging many urban areas and cutting off major roads, leaving thousands of motorists stranded. More than 30,000 flood victims across eight states and territories were recorded on an official government website, with over 14,000 of them in the central state of Pahang. Nearly 10,000 people fled their homes 
in the country's richest state of Selangor, which surrounds the capital Kuala Lumpur, with Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob expressing surprise at the severe flooding there. The Premier promised swift aid for the flood victims and initial funding of around 100 million ringgit or 23.7 million U.S. dollars to repair the damaged houses and infrastructure. Dozens of bus routes in and around the capital have been suspended along with train services to the port city of Klang. Operations at three water treatment plants in Selangor were also disrupted with taps expected to run dry for tens of thousands of people in parts of the capital state or in parts of the state as well as the capital. Malaysia's worst flooding in decades took place in 2014, forcing about 118,000 people to flee their homes. And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be back. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang paghirap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dikalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka na mangamba. Sasamahan ka namin ito pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, makakasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa new era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. Welcome back to the program. Eight Thais from two tour groups tested positive for the Omicron coronavirus variant. We have more from Veronica Carino, live from uh, Thailand. Hello, Veronica. Hello, December. Good afternoon. The Omicron coronavirus variant has been detected in eight Thai nationals 
who returned from an annual pilgrimage to the Islamic holy city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Authorities have urged people not to be alarmed about the imported cases because those who have been infected have been quarantined. According to Prida Chuapudi, an advisor to the Chularat Chamontri, the country's Muslim spiritual leader, about 30 Thai returned from a pilgrimage arrived at Suwanapum Airport on December 15. They were quarantined at a hospital or hotel hospital on Bangkok Soi Ramkangheim 5. The tests were carried out by doctors. He said, adding that the result revealed that seven people were infected infected with the Omicron variant. Mr. Prida also stated that six people were considered to be at high risk because they had close contact with the seven. All are now quarantined at a hostel which has a contract with a hospital, according to Mr. Prida. The country or the returnees flew from Saudi Arabia to Qatar where they transited before arriving at Suwanapum Airport, he said. While in Saudi Arabia, some had already developed symptoms such as fever. He stated that the returnees are from various provinces, including Nontaburi and Ayutthaya. According to Kusa Kukyat Kul, the Phuket Public Health Office's doctor, another group of 137 Thais returning from Mecca arrived in Phuket on December 13 and were tested for COVID-19. Five people tested positive for COVID-19 and were quarantined in Phuket for five days. Following the quarantine, the five who were classified as green patients with mild or no symptoms were allowed to seek further treatment at hospitals in other southern provinces while being closely monitored by health officials, according to Dr. Kusak. However, on December 17, Phuket Center for Medical Sciences reported that one of the five returnees tested positive for Omicron. According to Dr. Kusak, the patient had been quarantined and is being treated at Kokpo Hospital in Patani. On December 17, four foreign visitors to Phuket tested positive for Omicron. They arrived on four different airlines and used the test and go scheme to enter Phuket. There is an American, a Swede, a Tunisian, and a German among them. All four are now quarantined and being treated in a Phuket hospital, according to Dr. Kusak, who added that about 20 people who came into contact with the four are also in quarantine. According to Anurag Sarapha, Patani's public health doctor, the 137 Thai returnees underwent to RT-PCR testing in Saudi Arabia before flying to Phuket for additional RT-PCR testing. He also urged Patani residents not to be alarmed by the imported cases of the Omicron variant, but to continue taking precautions against the virus. According to the Patani public health official, the Omicron patient who is currently quarantined at Kokpo Hospital is an important case, not a local transmission case. According to local sources, residents in Patani were also concerned about the spread of Omicron variant among the Thai returnees from Malaysia. There are currently 57 Thai returnees from Malaysia in quarantine, but no Omicron infections have been detected among them. However, the cases have prompted provincial authorities to increase screening for foreign arrivals in order to keep the Omicron variant at bay, according to the sources. Meanwhile, Thailand reported 2,525 new COVID-19 cases and 31 new fatalities in the previous 24 hours, according to the Public Health Ministry today. This update is from Bangkok Post. Back to you, December. Thank you so much, Veronica, and uh, thank you for the update. And uh, please stay safe in Thailand. Thank you. And likewise, reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand, I am Veronica Carino, and we live in interesting times.
To Laos now, where the country has announced plans to partially reopen to foreign travelers in the new year, throwing a lifeline to the tourism industry after borders were sealed for more than 18 months to keep out COVID. Fully vaccinated visitors on pre book tours will be able to enter from January 1 and visit the capital Vientiane, eco-tourism hotspot Van Vieng, and UNESCO World Heritage listed Wang Prabang, according to state media. Further destinations will be opened up in April and July as vaccination rates in Laos increase. But entry will only be available to tourists from 17 nations, mostly Southeast Asian and European countries, as well as China, the United States, Australia and Canada. All visitors will also need to test negative for COVID before arriving. The reclusive communist nation this month opened a $6 billion Beijing-built railway that connects its capital to the southwestern Chinese city of Kunming. And health authorities are now rushing to deliver COVID booster shots to people living in tourist spots along the train line in anticipation of an influx of travelers. Laos was receiving about 4.7 million foreign tourists each year before the pandemic. But COVID led to an 80% downturn in international visitor numbers in 2020, with the economy in the doldrums despite very few coronavirus cases in Laos in the early stages of the pandemic. Economic growth declined to 0.4% in 2020, the lowest in three decades, according to the World Bank. Dutch. Dutch prosecutors will this week set out their sentencing demands for four men on trial in absentia over the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 in war-torn Ukraine in 2014. Prosecutors will also formally present the indictment during three days of hearing from Monday, charging the men with the murders of all 298 people on the Boeing 777. The four suspects, Russian nationals Igor Gurkin, uh, Sergei Dabinsky, and Oleg Kulatov, and Ukrainian citizen Leonid uh, Karchenko, have all refused to attend the trial in the Netherlands. A verdict of the high security court near Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport, where MH17 took off on its doomed flight in Kuala Lumpur is not expected until late 2022 in the earliest. The maximum penalty is life imprisonment, a court spokesperson told AFP. The hearing come as fresh tensions soar over Ukraine, with the West accusing Moscow of planning an invasion. International investigators say MH17 was shot down by a buck missile, missile uh, originally brought from a Russian military base as it flew over part of eastern Ukraine held by pro-Moscow separ um, separatists on July 17, 2014. Bodies of victims, some of them still strapped into their seats, were, were strewn across sunflower fields along the white, red, and blue wreckage of the plane. In other news, an alliance backing Malaysia's ruling coalition won a landslide victory at state polls on Borneo Island Saturday as the country gears up for a general election, possibly as soon as next year. The Sarawak Party's Alliance, or GPS, claimed at least 75 of 82 seats in a contest that saw 349 candidates competing for control of the country's largest state of Sarawak. The result for one seat remains unresolved as vote tallies were not completed due to bad weather and roads being cut off as unusually heavy rainfall hits the tropical nation, according to election officials. The four-party bloc is aligned with Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob's government at the national level, and their victory could give his coalition a boost. It follows a win for Ismail Sabri's party in another local poll last month and may further fuel expectations that a general election could be called the next year. The outcome of Saturday's polls means the GPS 
could play a kingmaker role in the upcoming federal election, offering support to whoever appears to have the best shot of emerging as the victor, according to an analyst. Malaysian politics has been in turmoil since early 2020 when a reformist government headed by Mahathir Mohamed collapsed after less than two years in power due to infighting. It was replaced by a weak coalition which itself fell apart early this year, paving the way for Ismail Sabri to clinch the leadership for his United Malays National Organization Party or UMNO. He was appointed directly as premier due to fears that a general election could have worsened the COVID-19 outbreak. Around 66 million voters are qualified to participate in the 2022 automated polls, according to the Commission on Elections. Comelec spokesperson James Jimenez released on Sunday. This For all, Comelec was able to tally 65.74 million registered voters who will be distributed in 34, 37,141 voting centers during the May 2022 polls. Kamenek earlier disclosed it needs the final list of voters and candidates before it could start printing the ballots for 2022 elections. Jimenez also said they expect to come out with the final list of candidates before the end of the month. The news continues in the CNN Focus. Alma and I will be right back after this short break. For English, press 1. If you're single, press me. I don't understand. You know what's magaling pa? Ang marites daw ay galing sa phrase na Mare, anong li- Panibagong linggo, panibagong laro Sa Game of the Day With Check Panis Nakabol Videos Wow, welcome! Welcome sa pinakabagong game show ng Net25! Maraming maraming salamat po sa napaka-init na pagtagat niyo sa akin para maging bahagi ng saya at panalo Agad, agad! It's been a while and you deserve it, but dimples should be seen everywhere! <laughs> Kaya simulan na natin ang paminigay ng agad-agad na kasiyahan at kasiyahan dito sa Nuas Game Show na diskarte at bilis ng kamay ang puhunan. Tatlong rounds ang paglalabanan ng apat na players. Isa sa kanila ang magwawagi ng 20,000 pesos na posible umabot ng hanggang 100,000 pesos! Sigurado ako mauuwi ko ang premyo na 20,000. Sigurado ako. Yan! Nasa akin eh. Nakita ko dun eh. Ano ko? Tara, game! Agad-agad! Kilo ako. Ito na ang pangalawang agawan choices. 17,100. Who? 12,000. C. 400,000. D. 1.7 million. Agad-agad! Pinindot siya ni Wes, so ikaw ang sasagot na to. Natakot ka sa numbers. Pag numbers kasi, ah, kainis eh. <laughs> Pero pag talent fee numbers, masaya yun. <laughs> Alex, sino ang pinipili mong sasagot ng tanong na yan? Wilma. Ang bilis. Alam mo, bakit? <laughs> bakit? Wilma doesn't know. <laughs> oh. And I'm your Tara Game Master, Agam Mulak. Woo! And this is Tara Game! Agad! 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 Welcome back. Laos opened a new $6 billion rail link with China to much fanfare this month, but analysts are warning the party could be short-lived as the government grapples with a potential debt crisis. Take a look. The line will connect the capital Vientiane with the southern Chinese city of Kunming, and there are grand plans for a high-speed rail network running to Singapore through Thailand and Malaysia. 
Laos President Tong Lin Sisulit at the opening heralded a new era of modern infrastructure development for the impoverished country, adding that, quote, the dreams of Lao people have come true, unquote. The government is hopeful the railway will turn a profit by 2027, but analysts are concerned about the unsustainable Chinese loans to pay for this and other projects. With a tiny domestic market, there is limited commercial logic for an expensive railway to connect the country of 7 million to Kunming, according to Jonathan Andrew Lane in an Asian Development Bank Institute report. His analysis found that potential benefits to Laos do not appear to outweigh the risks. He said that debt service will put further strain on the limited tax-raising abilities of the government, Lane wrote. Now Laos faces having to stump up vast sums of cash to pay for the rail line, which was set up as a Laos-China joint venture under Beijing's vast trillion-dollar belt and road infrastructure initiative, or BRI. As the reclusive uh, Southeast Asian country's overall debt climbs to a dizzying $13.3 billion, making up almost three-quarters of gross domestic product, experts fear Laos could be at risk of default. Now that could bind it further to China, having already attracted the moniker Chinese satellite state, Beijing accounts for 47% of its borrowings. Meanwhile, Philippine National Police Chief General Leonardo Carlos on Sunday, December 19, uh, alerted police units to be on the outlook for unscrupulous traders and businessmen who might take advantage of Typhoon Odette's aftermath. aftermath to hike the prices of basic goods in calamity hit areas. The local governments of Camarines Norte, Cebu, Bohol, and Negros Occidental have declared a state of calamity in the aftermath of Odette. The Department of Trade and Industry, or DTI, said an automatic price freeze is imposed in areas placed under a state of calamity. Aside from the uh, post-disaster relief and rehabilitation operations and disaster management measures being carried out by the PNP police units in the regional, provincial, city, and municipal levels were given added duties to monitor prices of goods in their respective areas to ensure the uh, proper implementation of Republic Act Number 7581 or the uh, Price Act. Sections 6 and 7 of the law expressive expressly uh, provide that prices of basic necessities in an area shall automatically be frozen at their prevailing prices or placed under automatic price control whenever that area is proclaimed or declared a disaster area or under a state of calamity and a price ceiling may be imposed on any basic necessity or prime commodity considering the imp the impendency existence or effects of a calamity. Basic commodities collectively refer to rice, corn, bread, fresh dried and canned fish, and other marine products of fresh pork, beef, poultry meat, fresh eggs, fresh and processed milk, fresh vegetables, root crops, coffee, sugar, cooking oil, salt, laundry soap, detergents, firewood, charcoal, candles, and drugs classified as essential by the Department of Health. Violators may face imprisonment for a period of not less than one year, but not more than 10 years, or a fine of not less than 5,000 pesos, but not more than 1 million pesos. Meanwhile, the BBM SARA unit team on Sunday visited several provinces hit by Super Typhoon Odette, or international name Rai, and turned over to local officials their assistance for displaced residents. Take a look. The former Senator Bongbong Marcus Jr. and House Majority Leader Martin Romualdez met with Southern Leyte Governor Damian Mercado at the provincial capital and handed over 2 million pesos financial assistance and 2.5 million pesos worth of relief goods from unit team in a simple ceremony. Masin City Mayor Nico Mercado and his father, Public Works and Highway Secretary Roger Mercado, witnessed the event. Romualdez also said the BBM Sara unit team 
and their allies responded quickly to the devastation caused by Super Typhoon Odette, which ripped through the Philippines. At around 11 a.m. in Agusan del Norte, their second stop on a four-province swing in Visayas and Mindanao, Marcos and Romualdez turned over to Butuan City. Mayor Ronnie Vicente Lagnada and Vice Mayor Jose Joboy Aquino the second, 2 million pesos financial assistance and 5 million pesos in relief goods from UNITEAM. The UNITEAM was set to visit Bohol and Cebu provinces Sunday afternoon to also provide aid to typhoon victims. Relief operations of the UNITEAM continue meanwhile in typhoon-affected areas in Butuan, Bohol, Cebu and Masbate. Marcos earlier thanked supporters and volunteers who responded to his call on Wednesday, a day before Typhoon Odette entered the Philippine area of responsibility to repack relief goods in anticipation of the massive relief effort. Minutes after his call, donors and volunteers trooped to the BBM Sara warehouse in Taguig City, bringing with them sacks of rice, tons of canned goods, and other essentials. Marcus earlier also appealed to electric cooperatives in Luzon and Mindanao that were not affected by the typhoon to send linemen and materials to areas where electric power has has not yet been restored. And Asian stocks fell on Monday on fears about a fresh global surge in coronavirus infections. And as the future of U.S. President Joe Biden's massive social spending bill was thrown into doubt after it lost the crucial vote of moderate Democrats. With traders beginning to wind down ahead of the festive season, analysts said trade was thinner and markets more susceptible to swings. But the mood has become increasingly glum as central banks start pairing their huge financial support to fight inflation. At the same time, economies are taking a hit as the fast-spreading Omicron coronavirus variant forces government to reimpose containment measures while consumers are staying at home. Omicron remains a concern and cases are on the rise, said Robert Shine of Blank Shine Wealth Management. Investors should be prepared for COVID to continue to be a main factor in market performance heading into 2022. After the bull run we've seen over the past 21 months, investors aren't as used as to prolong periods of volatility. Investors got another negative lead from Wall Street, where all three main indexes ended sharply lower on Friday after the uh, Federal Reserve said it would speed up and uh, taper of its bond buying program and indicate three interest rate hikes before the end of 2022. Well, the announcement was initially welcomed as clearing up some policy uncertainty. It signaled the beginning of the end of the era of cheap cash that has helped propel global markets to record or multi-year high for much of the past two years. Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Seoul, Singapore, Sydney, Taipei, Manila, and Jakarta were all well down, though Wellington out, uh, at small gains. Back to the uh, news on uh, Super Typhoon Rai. Telecommunications providers Smart and Globe said on Sunday they continue to restore services in the areas that were hit by Typhoon Odette, international codename Rai. Take a look. Smart said it has reconnected Cebu, Dinagat, Shargao, and Surigao using smart satellite phones, which enable communication links for local officials and response teams conducting rescue, relief, and recovery. It also turned over 200 5G-ready SIMs to help affected residents latch on to Smart's network that has kept the 6th district of Negros Occidental connected even at the height of Odette. For its part, Globe said it has restored services in Bukidnon, Agusan del Sur, Camigin, Zamboanga del Sur, and Zamboanga, Sibugay. Odette affected roughly 40 Globe towers in Visayas and Mindanao, with the Cebu, Negros, Bohol, and Leyte being hardest hit areas. For its part, Globe said it has restored services in Bukidnon, Agusan del Sur, Camigin, Zamboanga del Sur, and Zamboanga, Zibugay. 
Odette affect affected roughly 40 Globe Towers in Visayas and Mindanao, with the Cebu, Negros, Bohol and Leyte being hardest hit areas. Both telcos also launched relief efforts to help the residents of the affected areas. And still in the Philippines, Ipalay City, the top tourist destination in Negros Occidental, is urgently appealing for assistance after one of the areas hit hardest by Typhoon Odette. In the aftermath of tropical cyclone winds and rains that pummeled and uh, inundated uh, south southern Negros overnight on December 16, Sipale was left with at least 16 people dead, the highest in Negros Occidental based on city government data as of Monday, December 20. The city and its neighboring localities still have no power supply and mobile data connection in the area is limited. City Tourism Officer Jerry Lacson told the Philippine News Agency that tourists staying in Sipalay during the onslaught of Odette are safe. No missing, injured, or casualty among tourists, he said. On its Facebook page, the Sipalay City Tourism Office advised tourists with existing booking to contact their resort or hotel before finalizing their upcoming trip. Almost all of the establishments are damaged and signal is very limited, it said. It added the approval of requests for SPAS or safe, swift, and smart passage permit will not be prompt or fast due to limited electricity and internet signal. Electricity is not available, mobile signal is limited, water lines are destroyed, livestock and crops are severely affected, trees are uprooted, and electrical poles are scattered all around, and barangay roads are mostly blocked, the tourism office said. With these, we appeal for your understanding about our situation and that we cannot promptly respond to all your messages and queries, it added. In a separate post, Lakson also appealed for assistance. Lakson said donations from within Sipalay can be coursed through the city social welfare and development office at the Emergency Operations Central in Barangay 3, while in kind items such as Food and clothes can be dropped at the Negros Sanon Young Leaders Institute Incorporated on the second floor of Negros for Cyber Center in Bacolod City. Monetary donations are also accepted. City Public Information Officer Keith Brandon Carrie Ann asked those sending out donations to prioritize first aid kits, face masks, and medicines. On Sunday, December 19 afternoon, an initial 500 family food packs from the Department of Social Welfare and Development arrived in the city. The Philippine Coast Guard's BRP Nueva Vizcaya also delivered house repair materials, hygiene and family kits, and one rubber boat with an engine. And finally in our news, the country is looking at Israel as a partner in boosting its response to terrorism and improving the capability of the armed forces of the Philippines. Let's listen in. And also in, uh, in defense. We consider Israel as our one that we're looking at in response to terrorism and also on how we can improve the armed forces of the Philippines for its capability, not only against terrorism, but it, on how to have uh, a good external defense uh, capability. The Philippine Navy is also expected to acquire eight units of fast attack interdiction craft missile from Israel under a government-to-government -government procurement scheme. The acquisition of the FAIC-M is among the 2019 projects approved by President Duterte under the Horizon 2 list of the revised AFP modernization program. Aside from defense, Ambassador Alberto said
The two nations are also engaging on ways to battle the coronavirus disease. He also extended anew the government's gratitude to Israel for sending two medical teams earlier this year to share their best practices on COVID-19 management and effective vaccine rollout. Ambassador Alberto noted that Israel had always been ready to lend help even before the pandemic. And that's all we have for you on today's broadcast. Thank you very much, December, for uh, keeping me company today on ASEAN in Focus. My pleasure, Alma. Thank you. And that's the latest news in the dynamic ASEAN region. I'm December Paras of EBC Indonesia Bureau, and we live in interesting times. And we'll see you back tomorrow, same time, same place, here on ASEAN in Focus. I'm Alma Angeles. We live in interesting times.